All right, let's jump into DNC 22 through 24. We're going to skip Emma and go to 26. And we'll come back and give Emma some, some of her own time. Um, so, context, DNC 22. There are a bunch of people that are joining the church as the church is uh, more people in the area, especially Colesville area, are uh, learning about the church. And uh, this question comes up by many. Maybe you've seen this on a mission. He says something like, but I've already been baptized. <laughs> Do I need to get baptized again? Right. That's exactly what the NC-22 is answering. Uh, the accepted Protestant practice at that time was that the baptism of a person in one faith was sufficient when seeking admission to another faith. You want to change churches. Uh, if that person was a decent and god very person, that was fine. Orson Pratt tells us later that... Uh, those that were making this request were likely Baptists, so the Baptist denomination. Very moral, no doubt as good people as you can find anywhere. So they're wondering, based on this Protestant practice, if it's okay if they join the church without being Baptists. What's the correct answer? I want to give you guys a challenge, okay? Here's the challenge as we get to the content here. Uh, we like a word. We like a word a lot when we talk about this. But the Lord doesn't use that word in DNC 22 when he explains the reason. The answer is no, but the reason is not the word that we like to use. Authority. Yeah, we like that word. What's the word again? Authority. authority. He doesn't use the word authority. Elder McConkie couldn't help putting it in the section uh, summary there. <laughs> Authoritative baptism is required. But it's not actually in the text. So here's the challenge. Uh, without using the word authority, describe why someone needs, must be baptized into the church even if they've already been baptized into another church. Okay? Actually, I actually want you to do this. I'm not rhetorical. So try this. Uh, take 30 seconds and try to actually explain it. And then feel free to use DNC 22 and get the, the rhetorical <laughs> power of DNC 22. What is. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, pause for a second if you don't want to try it. Uh, yeah, read DNC 22. It's four verses. And then I want you to kind of put in your own words what the Lord is saying here. Um, get into His logic. Pretend like you know nothing. Pretend like you're one of these Baptist people and you want to join the church. You don't understand why you can't just join without being baptized. Digest and ponder what 22 is saying. Okay. Take a minute. Fascinating. He doesn't say the word authority. What does he say? Okay, turn your neighbor, try it. Ready to go. Sorry, camera people. Dead word. If you're watching this, I want you to stop the tape and discuss with your companion. But I don't know what the word you would use. Like some authority. What do you think? Something different. Isn't that what it is? Authority. Uh, not necessarily. Just without using authority. So I'd say um, you have to be baptized because God there nullified all past covenants that you've ever made. They're now worthless because now He's starting a new and everlasting covenant, and you have to make that new and everlasting covenant. Because your works are dead. Yeah. Previous to that. Yeah. I don't know how well they feel like that. Also, that works. It is a restoration, though, you know? Yeah. It's time to restore your hair. I'm going to understand that kind of question. All right, all right, all right. Bring it in. We have to restore it. Context. Yeah. 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 In context. Talk me through it. Miss Fallon, loquacious. Loquacious. Give me some loquation. Is that a word? I don't think that's a word. Uh, why can't, why can't, I've already been baptized. Why must I be baptized again? Don't use the word authority. This is the new and improved baptism. The new and improved baptism. Improved how? I don't know, but what struck me was it's a new and everlasting covenant. Yeah. Not the old covenant. That's right. That's all I that's all I got. It's pretty good. So the Lord couches this in the new and everlasting covenant. Right. He mm -hmm. says it's a new and everlasting covenant. 
So all baptisms prior to the new and everlasting covenant being restored are nullified. Dead works. They're dead works now, right? Like the law of Moses was. Does God love people who do the best they can to commit to Him by being baptized in whatever way? Is He okay with that? Does He love them? Yeah. Will that baptism count for them eternally? No. Is He grateful for the gesture? I'm sure He is. But he says, that's not, that's not going to work. When the new and everlasting covenant is on earth, then what do we need to do? You must enter into that new and everlasting covenant the authorized way. Oh, I said authorized. The, the way in which... <laughs> he says, the new one. Enter in at the gate. Yeah, as, I, <laughs> as I have commanded. And he speaks as one with... Authority. Okay. So uh -huh. Power. So don't power. Counsel, he speaks yeah. powerfully. Yeah. Accessing the power of God. Yeah, Joseph Smith, okay, he's the word. Uh, he says, none others will be all acknowledged by God or angels except for those that are received the ordinances under the hands of the ordained and authorized of God people. A legal administrator, he calls him. So, so that language develops over time in Joseph, but this is the original. The legal, it has to be a legal administrator that can give you authorized access into the everlasting you notice in third Nephi, Jesus does this, right? With Nephi, when he asks, calls him up, gives him authority to baptize. But he was just baptizing a few chapters earlier, remember that? And you're kind of like, Ugh. was Nephi out of bounds doing that? Or, uh, what, is, what does Jesus say? The law of Moses has been fulfilled, right? He'll explain that a few chapters later. All old things have, are, are, are dead, and all things have become new. What's he starting? The new dispensation where the law of Moses is not part of that. And the, the new and everlasting covenant is, is everything's becoming upgraded. So let me give you authority to baptize into the new and everlasting covenant. Seems to be, you connect to the NC22, probably what's going on there. Yeah. Seth, do you have a comment? Just that we see this in the New Testament. You have John the Baptist baptizing disciples to him, yeah. who will later be rebaptized, including apostles, later <coughs> be rebaptized in. in Jesus' name. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Great connection. Okay, good. That's it with 22. Let's go to 23. Context of the... Uh, it's supposed to say 23. Context of DNC 23, we have five people anxious to know. What else can I do? They want to know their respective duties in relation to the work. Um, and uh, so Joseph inquires, receives rapid succession five revelations that were originally written down by John Whitmer. They were written down uh, one after the other. In the Book of Commandments, they're se separate sections. They're like one or two verses apiece. And in 1835, Joseph said, let's just put them all into one section. And so, so DNC 23 uh, is the revelation to these five men. And all f five of them, except for one, so that's only four, uh, is told that uh, he is without condemnation. Uh, so that means by omission, one of them is what? Under condemnation. Uh, find out who the guy is. Look at verse in section 23. Which one of the, these five men does the Lord not say he's not under condemnation? <laughs> There's a lot of negatives in that sentence. Verse 1 is Oliver under condemnation. No. Good. Hiram's not. Sam is not. But yeah, there you go. Uh, Joseph Sr. is not. But Joseph Knight is in verse 6. Uh, what what is it that Joseph Knight has not done yet that the Lord wants him to do? Pray vocally. Yeah, take up your cross. Pray vocally. The idea of taking up your cross for him uh, likely meant get baptized, like shoulder the full burden of discipleship by getting baptized. Uh, Joseph had not yet been baptized, Joseph Knight. In fact, in his own words, he says, on the day the church was organized, old Mr. Smith... Martin Harris went forward and was baptized, being the first I saw baptized in the new and everlasting covenant. Oh, shoot, sure, he's using that language, right? I had some thoughts to go forward, but I had not read the Book of Mormon, and I wanted to examine a little more, I being a restorationer, and had not examined so much as I wanted to, but I should, should have felt better if I had gone forward. But I was baptized in June with my wife and family. June comes after her. April. Yeah. June comes after April. You guys know that? It really does. Uh, so at that point, he was no longer under this condemnation. So he's the one that gets uh, a little bit of special attention there. Uh, but Oliver Cowdery, what's that? 
restorationer. Oh, what does he mean by restoration? Right? Mean restoration. Yeah, there's a lot of people during that time that wanted to get back to the Bible. They wanted like biblical Christianity to be restored. There's like a branch of restorationists. Yeah, so people were like looking for the restoration. Right? They would call themselves restorationers, or restorationists. Yeah. So, so that wasn't a word, Joseph. Kind of. We always think it. Or I always thought. It was. Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. You think restoration means Joseph. When he's saying restoration, he's saying people that are looking for biblical Christianity to come back fully. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other churches that some of them, sometimes they're called seekers, right? Like Alexander Campbell, uh, Campbellites, you've heard of them? Mm -hmm. Sidney Rigdon will come from that group. They're, they're seekers or they're restorationists, you'd call them. John Taylor, that group up in Canada, that group was waiting for biblical Christianity to be brought back. Um, they, did, they, they, would, they would stay aloof from organized religion because they were waiting for the real the real deal, right? So when Parley B. Pratt performs a miracle and heals that woman in Canada, John Taylor's like, that looks a lot like biblical Christianity. They chat for two weeks. He's like, I'm in. So, um, yeah, they're looking for biblical Christianity. Yeah, that's the idea. Um, Oliver Cowdery is warned, right, in verse 1. What's he warned about? Pride. Beware of pride. What was Oliver Cowdery's downfall? Pride. It was pride, yeah. It turns out it was pride. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's good. You had to go on a limb, but uh, you nailed it. Yes. Pride. Uh, he once told Joseph Smith, if I leave this church, the church will crumble to pieces. Joseph said, you try it, Oliver. He did. <laughs> hey, look at us now. And I'll let the fate of the church show that you research what happened <laughs> to the church, if it, if it fell to pieces or not. Well, he was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. He was the second elder, and yet he was wrong. Yeah. Right. Uh, good, 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 good. Now uh, let's talk about Samuel because he. This is this is pretty awesome. Samuel in 23. He has a cool uh, story that flows from this section. The aftermath. We would call this not the context, but the aftermath. <coughs> verse four. A uh, few words to Samuel. Verse four. Thou art also under no condemnation. Thy calling is to exhortation, teaching, to strengthen the church. You're not as yet called to preach before the world. Amen. Signaling that he soon would be called to preach. He wasted very little time. Uh, he's the very first missionary in this dispensation, if you want to call him that. He got a knapsack, put some Book of Mormons in it. Uh, actually, one, I think. And then he went from Palmyra down to Menden. And when he went to Menden, uh, he went to the Tomlinson Inn. And in the Tomlinson Inn, there was a fellow by the name of Phineas Young. And uh, Phineas tells his own story. He says, April 1830. Wait, when was this revelation given? <laughs> April 1830. Samuel, you're not as yet called to preach. So on that day, he wasn't. Right? <laughs> and then he's like, so maybe you call this exhortation. Uh, so, he, uh, so he goes, uh, he says, I was on my way home from the town of Lima where I'd been, been to preach. And he says, I stopped at the house of a man in the name of Tomlinson to get some dinner. While engaged in conversation with the family, a young man came in, and walking across the room where I was sitting, he held a book toward me, saying, There is a book, sir, I wish you to read. The thing appeared so novel to me that for a moment I hesitated, saying, Pray, sir, what, what book have you? Book of Mormon, or as it's called by some, the Golden Bible. Ah, sir, then it purports to be a revelation. Yes, said he, it's a revelation from God. I took the book, and by his request, looked at the testimony of the witnesses. Said he, if you'll read this book with a prayerful heart and ask God to give you a witness, you'll know the truth of this word. I told him I would do so. Then asked him his name. He said his name was Samuel H. Smith. Ah, said I, you're one of the witnesses. Yes, said he, I know the book to be a revelation from God, translated by the gift of power of the Holy Ghost. And then my brother, Joseph Smith, Jr., is a prophet, seer, and revelator. That's awesome. What a great pattern for like all missionaries ever, right? Minus, you have to be a witness. Um, <laughs> but just that pure testimony, beautiful. What happens? He rejected the gospel and then that's it. No, I'm just kidding. No. What happens? Phineas Young has a family. Yeah, brother named Brady. Yeah, he does. So Phineas, he loaned his copy of the Book of Mormon to his father, John Young Sr., who read it and declared it to be the greatest work he'd ever seen. Phineas then lent it to his sister, Fanny Murray, who, after examining it, declared it to be a revelation. Subsequently, Fanny gave it, that book to her brother, Brigham. Brother Brigham, right there. Um, in due course, I think it was a month later or so, this copy of the Book of Mormon, along with another that he brought a month later, he gave to Rhoda Young Green, uh, which was another young family member. 
who married uh, John P. Green. I think is his name. Yep. Uh, Try to say that in your high school class without anyone laughing. Uh, that <laughs> resulted in the conversion of almost the entire John Young senior family and Heber C. Kimball and his family. Eventually, the Youngs and the family uh, and the Kimballs and other convicts make up the Menden, New York branch. Here's Brigham Young and his brothers. I wonder which one's Brigham. Lot <laughs> <laughs> uh, the crew right there. Good looking bunch. When was that thing? Brigham got the. Him and John. Him and John. Uh, yeah, but John has a sad face. Brigham has like a watch out face. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You guys are glad I'll take pictures. It's been on smiling, right? Is that what uh, so Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball, are they going to make any impact? So Samuel's, Samuel's Book of Mormon circles around. These two come in. These are two of the original members of the Twelve. The only two, Joseph says, that don't ever lift the heel against me. Um, others of them struggle. Um, a lot of them stayed faithful after some brief struggles, but others apostatized. These two never did. They are stalwart, true and true. Uh, yeah, what can we say about them? Everything, so much. You're, you and I are probably here because of them, correct? Uh, their missions to England, um, and the, the flood of converts that come from the England mission, uh, that come to Utah, I mean, probably, most people in the church could trace their church lineage, how they came into the church, which missionaries taught which people, who taught which people, back to somehow to probably, I would guess, Brigham Young and Hebrews of Kimball. They're fantastic. So that's DNC 23. Super good. DNC 24. DNC 24. Uh, a lot of stuff happens. Some significant history happens between DNC 23 and 24. Uh, up in Colesville, the very first miracle happened. Joseph said that uh, Newell Knight, so, so Joseph goes to Colesville to uh, meet with the Knight family. They had a prayer meeting. Joseph turned to Newell Knight, asked him to say the prayer. Newell Knight said, I don't feel like praying. And he's like, okay. And he started feeling bad that he said he didn't want to pray. And Joseph said, just pray. And it'll, you know, if you fell into a ditch, you know, if you stayed in the ditch too long, or I can't remember exactly what he said, something like, like falling in a ditch and getting yourself out. He said, just pray. If you just pray, it'll help you get out of the ditch you're in. He's like, you're right. But then he felt bad for not praying. But it was too late, so he couldn't pray. And then he went out into the woods, and he, Joseph said he started feeling uneasy. He continued to feel worse in mind and body. Until reaching his own house, he appeared such to alarm his wife. He requested her to go and bring me and Joseph Smith to him. I went and found him suffering very much in his mind, and his body acted upon a very strange manner. His visage and limbs distorted and twisted in every shape and appearance possible to imagine. And finally, he was caught up, up off the floor in an apartment and tossed about most fearfully. His situation was soon made known to his neighbors. And everyone comes rushing in to kind of watch this weird thing happen in the middle of the night. Uh, as many as eight or nine grown persons got together to witness the scene. After he had thus suffered for a time, I succeeded in getting hold of him by the hand when almost immediately he spoke to me and with great earnestness requested of me that I should cast out the devil out of him, saying that he knew he was in him and that he also knew that I could cast him out. I replied, well, if you know that I can, I can, then it shall be done. And then almost unconsciously, I rebuked the devil and commanded him in the name of Jesus Christ to depart from him. When immediately Newell spoke out and said that he saw the devil leave him and vanish from his sight. Joseph says, this is the first miracle that was done in this church or by any member of it. And it was done not by man or the power of man, but was done by God, the power of godliness. So let the honor and praise be the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. What do we learn from that story, children? The devil teaches a man not to pray. <laughs> yeah, that's intense. Uh, that is an intense story about <clears throat> prayer. First miracle of the church, right there. Uh, then comes the first general conference. Same guy, Newell Knight. Has an amazing experience at general conference, the very first one, uh, where they sustained BNC 20, etc. Uh, they went from Harmony back up to Fayette. They're always holding conference at Fayette. That's the conference center. Okay. Uh, Joseph said they had a fantastic general conference. The Holy Ghost was poured out in a miraculous manner. Some people started prophesying. The heavens opened to some. Uh, Newell Knight uh, passed out. They had some of the, the uh, Alma or you know the, the Lamanite pass out conversions. Some of that started happening at this, at this conference. Newell Knight was one of them. 
Newell said, later he recorded, I felt my heart filled with love and glory and pleasure unspeakable at the same guy that had the devil in him. Uh, a few months later now. I discerned that all was going on in the room. A vision of futurity burst upon me and I saw represented the great work which through the instrumentality of Joseph Smith was to be accomplished. I saw the heavens opened. I beheld the Lord Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And it was made plain to my understanding that the time would come when I should be admitted into his presence to enjoy his society forever and ever. Such scenes as these were calculated to inspire the hearts of the saints with joy unspeakable. Yeah. And combined to create within us sensations of rapturous gratitude and inspire us with fresh zeal and energy in the cause of truth. And also to confirm our faith in Joseph Smith being the instrument in the hands of God to restore the priesthood again to man on earth and to set up the kingdom of God which shall never more be overcome. That was a good general conference. It was a really good general conference. Uh, great, great outpourings. But then uh, it got worse. It, it went from really kind of the, the high and sublime to the, the wicked and the horrible. The Colesville persecutions begin to happen. As more members start to join the church in Colesville, people start feeling threatened by it, especially preachers and other congregations start being threatened by this. So they start putting together mobs. Preachers do The preachers, yeah, they're the ones that, that would really do this. Joseph says we came back down from conference, then went up to visit the saints in, uh, in Colesville, and uh, they I'm trying to remember what my lines are doing. He says, after a few days I returned to Colesville, come to Oliver County for the purpose of confirming those who had been baptized. We had scarcely arrived at Mr. Knight's when the mob was seen collecting together to oppose us. We considered it wisdom to leave for home, which we did, without ever even waiting for refreshments. <laughs> well, yeah, so that's how bad it was. Um, our enemies pursued us. And it was oftentimes as much as we could do to elude them. Uh, so they come back on down here. And then Joseph says, We managed to get home after having traveled all night. People were chasing them. Uh, except a short time during which we were forced to rest ourselves under a large tree by the wayside, sleeping and wa watching alternately. Him and Oliver trying to race home. I will say, however, that amid the trials and tribulations, we had to wait through the Lord who well knew our infantile and delicate situation, bow shape for us a supply of strength, and granted us the line upon line of knowledge here a little and there a little, of which the following was a precious morsel. And he writes down Moses chapter 1. That's the context in which Moses 1 was received. Being hounded by Colesville mobbers. Meantime, notwithstanding all the rage of our enemies, we had much consolation and many things occurred to strengthen our faith and cheer our hearts. Shortly after our return home, we received the following commandments or revelation. That's the context that we're looking at now, right? Um, so you guys ever read Moses chapter 1? No. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good. Uh, complicated. Beautiful. Sublime doctrine in it. Uh, it frames the entire Bible. Rather than Joseph sitting back on his rocker, theologizing with his buddies, uh, that's how Moses 1 came, getting chased and hounded, and then in the midst of that, the Lord says, here's a precious morsel, right, and he got that. Was he saying that that happened like that night while he was That escaping? context, that season. Oh. Yeah. Amid the trials. Oh, yeah, during that yeah. season, yeah. Don't know if we could get more specific. Could have been that night. Yeah, don't know. So, pretty cool, but we're not talking about Moses 1, are we? We're talking about the Doctrine of Covenants, so we're going to get to the Doctrine of Covenants. Uh, so, DNC 24, see if this makes more sense. Now, by the way, you've seen the, there's way more context than this, like, you've seen and read about Joseph getting arrested, and then going to, going to court, getting vindicated, and then he gets arrested again, right there on the doorstep of the court. You, you heard these stories? I'm going to tell you one then. All right. So, so he got arrested <laughs> in Colesville. And uh, the, uh, the constable, he held him all night. Uh, he wouldn't let Joseph uh, have any freedom to go anywhere. He said he slept right by me. Like we were like touching. And anytime I would move, he, would, he said he had his arm like this. Anytime I would move, he would like, squeeze me thinking I was trying to escape. Uh, the constable put his feet against the door. So Joseph, so when the constable went to sleep, Joseph couldn't open the door. because He's like, I hadn't done anything. We went to a tavern, he said. We went to the tavern. Uh, people mocked me, spit on me, said, prophesy, Joseph. Prophesy. Just as they did, Joseph says in his journal, to Jesus Christ when they mocked him in his uh, trials. 
He said, I, what, and what did I do? You set the neighborhood in an uproar. So they took him to court that next day. In court, they, uh, they got a guy, uh, Josiah Stoll, who he'd worked for, and brought him up to the witness stand. So Josiah Stoll, is it not true that Joseph uh, has a team of horses from you? So, yeah, that's true. And did he not say that an angel of God told him to tell you to give him the horses? Uh, no, that is not true. He said, I'd like to buy your horses, and so he gave me a note for that. And has he paid you on the note? Uh, that's none of your business. Has he paid you on the note? No, he hasn't. I still have the note today, but I, uh, I trust him so, uh, so much that I would give him another team of horses on the same, uh, same terms. Next witness. Did you not get an oxen from Joseph Smith? Uh, yes, I, I got Yes. Or did he not get them from you? Yes. Did he not say an angel? Same thing. Like, no, he said, I'd like to buy your oxen. And, <laughs> and so he gave me money. <laughs> Next witnesses. So then they, they bring up two teenage girls. They're like, these two teenage girls. You knew Joseph as a youth. Yes, he did. And was he ever inappropriate with you in any way? They're like, no, he's, he's great in public and in private. He never treated us anything but respectfully. So he gets to, he gets vindicated <laughs> as he's leaving the courthouse. It's like Joseph Smith, you're under arrest. <coughs> like, what? Uh, then he, he goes to another court. So there's another constable from another jurisdiction. Takes him to the next the next day. They bring him to the witness stand. Newell Knight. <coughs> Newell Knight. Did Joseph Smith not cast the devil out of you? He's like, no, it was the power of God. Okay. Well, was Joseph Smith not the instrument? He's like, yes, he was. And pray tell, what did the devil look like? <laughs> you saw him flee from you? Yes, I did. Tell us what he looked like. Well, I, I'll answer your question with a question. Do you believe in spiritual things? Well, I, I, I'll never be so pretentious as to say that I believe in spiritual things. Well, then I can't tell you what he looked like because it was a visual, it was a spiritual sight, and I can't explain spiritual things to someone who's not spiritual. You know, everyone laughs, and it's like, ah, he hangs his head, the, the, the guy asks the questions. Nobody could find any fault with Joseph other than he set the neighborhood in an uproar with his preaching, and so they, they had to let him go, and that's the, that's the context where, now DNC 24, verse 1, Behold, thou was called and chosen to write the Book of Mormon and to my ministry. I have lifted thee up out of thine afflictions. Without context, you don't know what he's talking about here, right? And have counseled thee, and thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies, and thou hast been delivered from the powers of Satan and from darkness. Nevertheless, thou art not excusable in your transgressions. Nevertheless, go thy way and sin no more. Magnify thy office. Tell me about how, how you'd feel about verse 3 if you're Joseph. After you've sowed your fields in harmony and secured them, go speedily unto the church which is in Colesville <laughs> uh, yeah, and Manchester, and they shall support thee, and I'll bless them both spiritually and temporally. Go back to the, to the hotbed of persecution. I need you to go back there and, and bless them and strengthen them. Uh, and that is the... That's exactly what he does. He goes back up, and there are people waiting for him. It's actually in, in response to this revelation, when he goes back up to Colesville. You probably heard these stories. It's just nice to get them all in context. It's when he goes up, and people look right at, look him right in the face, and they don't recognize him. And he goes and does his, his spiritual work, uh, confirming the saints. Uh, Emma Smith was baptized during this time, uh, right before... Uh, uh, she was bad. They dammed. They dammed a dam. The mob broke it down. So the next early morning, they, they dammed it up real quick, hurried and baptized her and Joseph Knight, fulfilling DNC 23. Uh, and then the mob assembled and they, and they left. Uh, but during this visit, no mob action happened. Joseph's being obedient to section 24. It's like, okay. He goes up and no harm or accident or danger came upon him. Uh, he, was, he was fine. And people, the mobbers who hated his guts and were hunting. They, they looked right at him and did not uh, recognize him. So Joseph chalked that up to the blessings of obedience to the commandment of the Lord here. So that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So there's more in 24, but uh, I think for our purposes, let's go to 26. 26. Short little section. Again, admonishing Joseph uh, to continue to bless the church at Colesville. Continue to preach. Your time is to be devoted to studying the scriptures. That's not a general command. What's already started to happen? You saw it with Moses 1. What's, what's Joseph already getting in the mode of? Bible. Bible. Bible translation. 
Uh, so devote your time to studying the scriptures implicit in that is this idea of to do the work that I've already started with Moses 1. And continue to preach and confirm the church at Colesville. Okay? Help them out. And then he drops this interesting little line in verse 2. And all things shall be done by common consent in the church, by much prayer and faith, for all things you shall receive by faith. What's that? What's he talking about? Common consent? Anyone who knows what common consent is, please show me. By the usual. Okay, good. Yeah, common consent. It's just this. That's this where it started. That's the first mention of common consent. Um, to raise your hand and let the church have some vote or some say in what's happening. Um, well, let me ask you a few questions. Ponder and then answer, shall we? Uh, as we get into the, the implications of this. What is the role of common consent in the church? Why do we do it? How about just answering your heart? Why do we do this? Second, how does the law of common consent inform our understanding of the relationship between Christ, His prophets, and members of the church? It's kind of a three-part process going on here with common consent. And thirdly, based on this practice, what would you say is the government of the church? What type of government is it? Is it purely a kingdom, a monarchy? Is it a democracy? Is it a theocracy? Some blend of theo democracy, some kind. What is common consent? And what does that say about our relationship to God and His prophets? Why do we do it? What does that say about how the church is run and governed? Um, anything you want to say about this before we look at some of the prophetic teachings on this? What do you say about kingdom? Give me a kingdom. Kingdom of God on earth. Good. So monarchy, pure, pure and simple. What kind of a king lets his subjects affirm or dissent on his decrees? What kind of a king is this? What kind of a monarchy is this? Benevolent. Benevolent monarchy. Monarchy. Good. But if God is the king, then what is that? Theocracy. It's a theocracy. But he works through humans, mortal prophets, so what's that? Monotheo democracy. <laughs> Just smash a bunch of words together, maybe we'll get it right. Uh, here's what, uh, here'll be the answer. <coughs> Church is not a democracy. It's not why we do this. It's more like a kingdom than a democracy. In that we accept the Lord as the king, who has under his direction an earthly head, who operates and becomes his mouthpiece. It's an organization that's defined more accurately as a theocracy, which means it's something like a kingdom as the world would define it, and yet something like a democracy. <laughs> so that was kind of that settle the issue. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm feeling good about theodemocracy, uh, which is actually defined like this. Uh, this is in, I think, uh, Hiram M. Smith's book, uh, the DNC commentary by Hiram M. Smith. He calls it theodemocracy. Um, that's Joseph F. Smith's son who became an apostle. Form of government in which the decisions for the kingdom of God are God's decisions through his prophets, but in which his people have the opportunity to exercise their democratic presence to either accept or reject. His decisions in that kingdom through the principle of common consent, <coughs> or, or, reject, or reject those decisions uh, by common consent. Um, but when you actually do this, uh, like that's a decision you have to make, but when you do it, you're committed, right? Uh, President Nelson calls it a oath-like indication uh, when we invoke the law of common consent. It's an oath-like. We're not voting. It's like we're making an oath to sustain, to get behind the prophetic priorities of those that we sustain. So so right there, DNC 26 is the beginning of this. Are any of you guys bothered by this law when it when people do what you don't want them to do? Are you, are you bothered by... Should we just look at this? Father Brothers and sisters, President Monson has invited me to present the names of the general officers in Area 70s for your sustaining vote. It is proposed that we sustain Thomas Spencer Monson as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Henry Banyan Iring as first counselor in the First Presidency, and Dieter Friedrich Uchtdorf as second counselor in the First Presidency. 
Those in favor may manifest it. Those opposed, if any, may manifest it. Your, the, note, the vote has been noted. It is proposed the end, as prophets, seers, and revelators. All in favor, please manifest it. Now, language. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. The vote has been noted. He said by the same sign. <laughs> the same sign. <laughs> None of us were saying, yeah! or I when he said, <laughs> Woo! Uh, yeah. all those in favor, <laughs> ah! okay, <that's> nice. <laughs> by the same sign of you. Anyway, how many of you guys are bothered by that during conference? Bothered by that? Well, that bothers me sometimes. Yeah, it's yeah. It started to calm down, huh? That was that last, I don't think last conference. It was this yeah, they did last conference. Yeah, yeah they were walking yeah. up at the stand. They, well, it wasn't about sustaining, they just said something about. Authorities. Well, yeah, someone, someone yelled out. out. Someone, but it wasn't about sustaining. It was just no, wanting to yell something. Yeah. Protecting yeah. predators. Yeah, don't protect sexual predators. Yeah. Is that okay? You know what? We have our agency. Yeah. Were they escorted? I think they were. Not that guy, but this, this guy, these, these ones. Is that okay for that to happen? Yeah. That's why we. Why would we vote if they didn't have a choice? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just so it's not a vote. What is it? No. Sustain. Oh. Sorry, not vote. It's a, as you say, it's an, it's an oath-like indication that we recognize their calling as a prophet to be legitimate and binding upon us. So if you don't want to have them be legitimate and binding upon you, you can oppose, right? I remember someone that got excommunicated is the author of the CES letter when he got excommunicated. He stood on the back of his tr pickup truck outside the stake center. There was a bunch of people that were waiting for him, a bunch of like, people to cheer him on because they knew it was going to happen. And he stands up on the back of his pickup truck and he's like, I just excommunicated the LDS church. And everyone's like, Rrr. And then he's like, They only have as much power as you give to them. They only have as much power over you. That's what he said. As you get to them, I say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Yep. The guy's brilliant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you're actually giving them power. That's actually brilliant. Yeah. You're, you're giving them power. You're saying, I, I acknowledge that your choices are binding and legitimate for me, and I'm, I'm choosing to be bound by in a covenant, oath-like fashion to your prophetic priorities, and I'm doing it of my own free will and choice. How beautiful is that? What kind of a king is that, right? <laughs> and would you uh, say benevolent, benevolent or? Uh, oh, benevolent. Okay. Yeah. That's a that's a wonderful king. That's a that's a great system of government um, for the Church of Jesus Christ. Of Latter-day Saints. It really so, does yeah. illustrate a new and everlasting covenant because I don't think the people the law of Moses had any mm. of this. Going okay. The, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, well, one scripture where they hold up his hands during the during the battle. Is that like the same thing? <laughs> is that what was going on? <laughs> That's good. Yeah, exactly. I use that as a moment. Exactly. Too. <laughs> uh, so fun fun contest. That's the end of DNC twenty fourth or twenty. What was it? Twenty two through twenty four and twenty six.